Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I think we'll get underway, even though there might be one or two people still trying to find a park and get here. So welcome to this, the sixth of the Dean's Lecture Series for 2012. And tonight's lecture, of course, is being presented by Professor Michael Apple. Uh, this is actually his second Dean's Lecture. The first was in about the middle of 2007, I believe. Uh, but he's not the first to give two. He's the second to give two, but that's another story. You can receive <laughs> but I do acknowledge the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional owners of this land and I pay respect to elders both past and present of the Kulin Nation. In a few moments I'm going to hand over to Julie McLeod, Professor Julie McLeod, who has extensive insight into Mike's work and she's only actually going to set a context for tonight's lecture. And at the conclusion of Mike's presentation, Julie will come back and move a vote of thanks, after which I invite all of you to join me and Mike and others in the foyer for some refreshments. But before handing over to Julie, I'd like to now formally introduce Professor Michael Apple, a man who probably does not need to be introduced. You all know that Michael is one of the world's most distinguished scholars and an international leader in education policy studies. He's held numerous prestigious professorial appointments at major universities. He's currently the John Bascom Professor in the Departments of Curriculum and Instruction and Education Policy Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's also Professor of Education Policy Studies at the Institute of Education at the University of London and World Scholar and Distinguished Professor at the Education Policy Studies at East China Normal University in Shanghai. He's previously served as a World Scholar at the Institute of Education at London and in April 2012 he was awarded an honorary D. Lit from the University of London. In June 2012 he was the Hallsworth Visiting Distinguished Professor of Political Economy in the School of Education at the University of Manchester, one of my alma maters. He's been awarded the UCLA Medal for Distinguished Academic Achievement in 1998, equivalent to an honorary PhD. He's also been awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Education Research Association, the Curriculum Studies Division, in 1998. Michael Apple's research has led international scholarship on addressing problems of educational and social disadvantage and the challenges in developing socially just schooling. He's been at the forefront in building alliances with schools, with teachers, policymakers, and the academy to address these matters. He's published more than 300 journal articles and book chapters and 30 influential books, and many reissued and translated into European and Asian languages. He's a sought-after advisor and research partner with an outstanding record of engagement and collaborations with universities and education systems. He is recognised as one of the 50, 50 leading figures in education in the last 100 years. So, Michael, personally, I welcome you. And before handing over to you, I now ask Professor Julie McLeod who will set the scene. Thank you very much, Phil, and uh, welcome everybody. I won't uh, speak for very long. It feels like a bit of a tease before the big event. So I just wanted to say a few comments to elaborate uh, Phil's remarks on the importance of Michael's work and in particular the urgency of his critique in the present time. Michael's work has been fundamentally important in shaping research agendas for a generation and more of critical scholars in education. His books, from the groundbreaking Curriculum Ideology and Curriculum in 1979, through to Educating the Right Way, Markets, Standards, God and Inequality, and his more recent work on democratic schooling, critical education, social justice and global crises, have all confronted head-on the multiple dimensions of relations between education, power and structural inequalities. In the preface to one of the many new editions of Ideology and Curriculum, Mike reflected that his work has attempted to better understand, quote, the relationship between education and economic structure and into the linkages between knowledge and power. Coming from and reinvigorating neo-Marxist traditions, Mark, uh, Mike, Michael has systematically addressed how cultural and ideological processes shape the everyday practices of schooling and the kinds of knowledge, the curriculum, that counts as mattering, that it counts as official or legitimate knowledge. For him, critical educational studies seek to expose how relations of power and inequality 
are manifest and are challenged in the formal and informal education of adults and children. Yes, his work has definitely examined how schools reproduce economic and social disadvantage, but importantly, he has given prominence to the cultural and identity aspects of these processes of disadvantage. Looking to how these relations of inequality, of class, gender, race, ethnicity and sexuality intersect and create advantages and disadvantages. And he has insisted on looking for spaces to find opportunities for social transformation where power can be challenged and for how that can be achieved in schools and educational communities. I was reminded just recently of how Mike's work continues to influence a generation of new scholars. And a doctoral student of mine, and apologies, he's here, told me how excited he was that when he learnt that Michael Apple was visiting here, confessing that he went through a bit of a rampant phase digesting Michael's work and came out the other side. So <laughs> all the better for it. He is, Mike is, without doubt, a world-class scholar. But I want to say something very briefly about his role as a teacher and as a colleague. Michael's visit here is in part supported by University of Melbourne Dyson Fellowship and he's here to continue some of the collaborations that have begun between colleagues led by him at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, colleagues in the School of Education and at the Institute of Education at the University of London. We've had a very rich and um, productive engagement exchange for the last 10 years and Mike's been a leading figure in instigating that and sustaining that dialogue. So, as part of that, we've had joint teaching programs, we've had research agenda uh, pro projects, publications, and in all that, I have been utterly knocked out by what an inspiring and generous teacher Mike is, and what a serious yet very funny collaborator and colleague he is. He is someone who values serious intellectual work and enjoys a good argument. To me, they are hallmarks of a really good scholar. He does not expect agreement and consensus. He invites conflict and disagreement. And I think that's a too rare quality these days. He does stand out among educational researchers as someone who genuinely bridges the work and worlds of a scholar and an activist. He is a politically committed researcher and he is, to coin a new mantra, someone who was doing public engagement with high social impact well before that became an eviscerated agenda. His work has grappled with some of the obdurate problems of inequality that face too many educational communities today. He has alerted us to the directions and effects of current and emerging reform agendas and he's also shown some of the opportunities for change. Tonight's lecture on why we should be worried about current educational agendas look set to challenge us and to be vintage Michael Apple. Thank you, Mike. I'm going to get some water. I'm not leaving. <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint you. I'm wearing, I think, six of these. So let me see. I think this is the one I turn on. Is that better? OK, very good. Goodbye. Okay. All right. Uh, in some ways, I have nothing left to say after some lovely introductions. Uh, I'm always, uh, you know, as a, a child who grew up in an extraordinarily poor community and was a primary and secondary school teacher in that same community, and someone who was a vice principal, meaning principal in charge of vice, in a small elementary school in a rural area. I'm always amazed when I hear people talk about me, since on the one hand it's gratifying, and the other hand I don't quite recognize my past in the present. And I don't think I'm alone in those kinds of things. And the day that I forget where I'm from, I no longer have the right to be here. And I would assume that many of us have those similar kinds of sentiments. I too would like to thank the traditional owners of the land, and as I mentioned at one of my other favorite places, Victoria University here, in Wisconsin, my own home university, um, we in fact are on stolen land, and yet when I begin a lecture saying exactly what I just said, it is considered strange. 
I never wanted to be pro forma. We must constantly remember we are on stolen land. So let me repeat my act of respectful thanks, knowing that for all of us, I hope we mean it. Now, I appreciate, uh, I mean, it seems to be appropriate that I give this dean's lecture since, as Field mentions, uh, uh, I did give a lecture on a similar topic a number of years ago. And oddly enough, I want to revisit those arguments I made earlier. Uh, and uh, in many ways, things have gotten more worrisome and much worse since what I mentioned in the first edition of Educating the Right Way, almost everything has come true, which should make me feel very good about my work. On the other hand, it makes me suicidal as a practicing educator, since the landscape of education is littered with the corpses of failed reforms. And as a former teacher, though still a teacher, but as someone who spent a lot of years working in very difficult circumstances as a practicing educator, I'm tired of rhetoric, and I'm tired of the failed reforms. So I want to bring to bear a set of arguments and a set of empirical findings, knowing all I can do is outline in the time that we have here from a much larger set of issues. And many of my arguments uh, will be found in the second edition of Educating the Right Way, and in my new book, Can Education Change Society, which is coming out in three weeks. Uh, if I do get a little self-referential, uh, some of you know that my wife and I, and I the, sometimes I'm the other Professor Apple this time in this speech. Rima is the other Professor Apple. Professor Rima Apple is here. We have made a serious decision that we will accept no royalties on any of our work. That goes to places such as the Violence Against Women's Shelter, and other social mobilizations. So if, again, I say something that refers to my own work, it's not a plea that you buy my book. Though I do hope you do, because uh, it helps other people. OK, so uh, I understand that there is a tradition of the dean's lecture that we will try and finish at 7 o'clock. I will try. But because of that, there is not going to be a lot of time for questions. Uh, I don't like that tradition, usually. I will spend as much time as possible outside at the reception. And we'll look forward to questions, comments. As Julie mentioned, I enjoy arguing. I think that this is not about conversations about the weather. This is serious business. That means there's going to be disagreements. Education is a political and ethical act. And anyone in ministries of education or in schools throughout the world knows how political that can get when we struggle for enough resources to put policies that we believe in very strongly into practice. And when we watch children whom we can predict will drop out do so because there is such a strong relationship between impoverishment and the kinds of resources that we do not get to do the education that we know we must do. All right? So I want to talk about current reforms, and I want to talk quite seriously about them. By the way, quite in the US sense is not the British sense. British sense is diminutive. It means not really. In the United States, it means damn right. OK, so all right. I will occasionally use humor. I hope that you laugh uh, for one particular reason. My humor is quite bad. And I will keep trying to get you to smile. And that's nice if you do not at least chuckle. And I assure you that is not what you want me to do. But part of my lecture style, uh, if you are a person with the last name of Apple, and for my first two years was a substitute teacher in inner city schools of the slums of Patterson, New Jersey, if you walk into a different classroom every day and say, good morning, children, to five-year-olds, um, and you say, my name is Mr. Apple, you better have a very bad sense of humor because it will take four years for the kids to get off the light fixtures. So, okay. So let me now begin. I mentioned that things are getting much worse. There is a particular kind of way in which education is being pushed in particular directions. And those directions are often those things that many of us in this room who have spent our lives in often martyrdom about trying to build schools and policies that make a difference in real teachers and real schools and real communities and real students' lives 
are not things that we would agree with. Excuse me, my sixth grade teacher is speaking to me with which we should agree. <laughs> and I want us to think about this as a in a particular way. That in many ways what we are seeing is a radical transformation of what counts as a good school, what counts as a good student, what counts as a good curriculum, what counts as a good society, what counts as a good identity. And in many ways, this is shifting most policies, including those often, and in my mind, quite distressingly so, in labor governments as well as deeply conservative capital L liberal, liberal governments throughout the United States. As one example, my wife and I and many other people in the United States were in tears when Barack Obama was elected. Little did we know that the first policy he would put in place would be pushing for performance pay for teachers, a failed policy in which there is no robust evidence anywhere in the world that it works. And the movement towards value-added material that backs it up, the founder of Value Added in the United States, who is a colleague of mine, and that's Douglas Harris, has said, I quote now from the New York Times in quite a candid interview, who has said the following, that we are 20 years away from being able to do performance evaluation based on value added. Now, he is one of the larger advocates. Now, do not misinterpret my claims here. I want evidence, and I want as much evidence as possible. And there are some people who should not be teachers at all, and I do not want them in classrooms. I would say the same about people who are professors, doctors, lawyers, people who move my furniture, etc. So do not misinterpret me. I'm making an empirical as well as ideological claim here. All right? But I will come back to that. So, uh, so again, it's important that we realize that I must outline a set of claims, and sometimes it will seem as if I'm attacking people who spend their lives trying to do good things. I'm not attacking that. Okay. Now, we are seeing a new alliance, a new group of people who are pushing education in particular directions, what I want to call conservative modernization. This is a group of people, often on the right, but not only on the right. And it is not simply what we call academically neoliberals who believe one simple thing, that private is good and public is bad. It's a much larger assemblage of people who are pushing education in particular directions. And I want us to think about this using a particular metaphor, a metaphor of an umbrella. It is raining in education for almost everyone in this room and millions of people outside this room. It is raining for parents who look at the possible decline of the extraction industries in Australia or in my nation, the factories moving to China and then from China going to other places as well. It is raining for their children, and they see the possibility of downward mobility. And in my own nation, we have the highest rates of downward mobility since the Great Depression. So it is raining in education for them. It is raining for businesses and for corporations. I quote from one of them in the United States and in England, where a similar quote has now surfaced. Schools are black holes into which we pour money, and PISA scores do not come out. So it is raining in education. Okay? Well, it is raining in education for teachers who are being told, we are cutting your resources. We are raising class sizes. We are telling you we have the one model of teaching and evaluation. We are de-skilling the profession, which is exactly what is happening in many ways. So it is raining for teachers. It is raining for administrators who in my country do not have tenure at all and can be replaced quite easily when achievement test scores do not rise. It is raining in education. It is raining for minoritized people, many of whom say, I quote now, there is cultural genocide going on in schools. My child no longer knows who she is. All of it is raining, and the task of dominant groups is to do, you'll forgive, occasionally I must quote, so you can add up how many thunks I give. When I reach 50 names, I will stop no matter what. As Althusser reminded us, that's one. Okay. Again, okay, but you've got 49 to go now. Okay, so listen carefully. It's how I, it's how I survived graduate school. Boring lectures, that's the 37th thunk, the 37th name. So that's one. Um, all right. 
That you almost smiled at. All right, so as Alcacer reminds us, the task of dominant groups is to engage in interpolation. It is reigning to beckon people to come under a particular umbrella. Do not come under Michael's umbrella, come under other people's umbrella. So the task of dominant groups is to creatively engage in what we might call a vast social and pedagogic project to say, I want you to get out of the rain. You wish to get out of the rain. Come under this umbrella. Okay. So if we want to think about this as a multiplicity of umbrellas with a multiplicity of particular agendas under them, the right has engaged in a vast pedagogic project. In fact, as some of you will know this quote from me before, the only true Gramscians left are on the right. They understand that the struggle over common sense is absolutely central to the transformation of schools and the larger society. So it's a process of beckoning, and that means we must take particular kinds of metaphors, particular kinds of ways of thinking about schools and teachers and curriculum evaluation, and change our understanding of what's good and what's bad. That's the process. It is a form of social pedagogy. Now, this umbrella has four hands holding it. Let me specify each one just for a second. The first is what historically has been called neoliberalism. That's a catchword for something that says the following. What is private is good, and what is public is bad by its very nature. The state is inefficient, too bureaucratic. We must shrink the state. We must shrink the tax burdens on the job creators, in quotes. That's a quote from Mitt Romney right now in the United States. I never thought I would use Mitt Romney's name in public. <laughs> I'm feeling really bad now. <laughs> <laughs> that, that counts as 10 right there, <laughs> with great shame. Um, okay, so, um, and this is a particular kind of ideological form, which again says, the corporate sector is the most efficient sector in society. We must bring the technologies and ideological forms and mechanisms from the corporate sector. We must have schools compete against each other. We must have teachers compete against each other. And in fact, by installing particular forms of measurement, we have a new identity for people who must show that they are constantly providing evidence that they are succeeding. So it's a transformation of the labor process. It's a transformation that drives administrators often crazy, especially in a time when resources are tighter and tighter in most nations. Now, neoliberals believe in what we might call then a weak state. Now, this is an eloquent fiction. There is no such thing as a weak state under neoliberalism. So as I've mentioned before, the simplest concept in economics is this. It's a zero-sum game. This is the amount of money that we get in taxes for people in ministries of education to spend on schools. We're not going to get a lot more. And if we do, it's going to go to private schools. I promised myself I'd be careful. I'm no longer being careful. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so here's the amount of money we have. In my state, the state of Wisconsin, the most progressive state in the United States, supp supposedly, though it's also the home of Senator Joseph McCarthy of McCarthyism fame. Populism has multiple contradictions. This is the amount of money we have. In my state, one out of every four African-American young men is now in public prisons. The prisons are being privatized. One out of every 11 African-American women is in prison. One out of every 17 Spanish-speaking, Latino, Mexicano, Chicano people is in prison. One out of every nine indigenous people is in prison. I don't call that a weak state. That's a vast tax transfer policy in which the same amount of money comes from education and social welfare and health and goes into the prison system. So we are perfectly willing to give you free housing, free health care, free education, provided you are willing to be jailed. Now, you'll forgive me for talking quite brusquely, but I want to be honest about the fiction that stands behind these kinds of things. I would urge you to look at the budgets in this nation as well and pay particular attention to Queensland because you will see those statistics going up massively to match the progressive state of Wisconsin very, very soon, okay? So this vision of a weak state is a fiction. 
It is quite a strong state, but it's a strong state in the injustice system. But let me go on. I'll come back and say more about the educational implications of this in a second. There's a second group that we might want to call, and in fact I do call, neoconservatives. These are groups not with an economic agenda, though they do agree with the economic agenda of neoliberals. This is a group that believes in a strong state over knowledge, values, the curriculum, we must tightly control it, and the strong control of women's bodies, and the strong control of indigenous people's bodies, that is the institutionalized other. And this group has a particular vision that what is wrong with schools is not so much that they're inefficient, but that we have lost the vision of what counts as real knowledge. So we must install, we must have a romantic return to a particular sense of what it means to be Australian, what it means to be, in quotes, American, a word I never use since, as I remember, Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Chile, Argentina, Costa Rica is America too. Words like I am an American are imperial words. They are never neutral words, to say the least. But this attempt, in many ways, to restore a particular vision of the past is what Pierre Bourdieu would call an act of symbolic violence. In none of our nations is there a unitary past. And I'll come back to that in a second. But we must remember that this past is a construction, as all history is. Of course, there are historical facts we must cherish. And there are traditions we must have reborn to keep alive. But this fiction, the eloquent fiction, that somehow we can have a consensus over knowledge without the political discussions about whose tradition we are restoring is in fact an act of violence. There is a third group, which oddly enough is my favorite group because it is populist. It's what Stuart Hall, that's now 12, since Romney I've admitted is 10. <laughs> um, and this is a group we want to call uh, authoritarian populists. And they believe one simple thing, um, that the people must decide, but there's worthy people and there's unworthy people. Or to quote from them, you know, God spoke in English. <laughs> he spoke to King James. King James wrote it down, and he made no mistakes. Or as a bumper sticker in the faculty parking lot of my university says, so it's one of my colleagues, which makes me very nervous. Um, God said it, I believe it, there can be no argument. <laughs> I want to be very cautious about this because I work with religious activists throughout the world. So do not see me again as being opposed to the moral fundament of certain people's actions. As some of you know, I worked dramatically and quite for a quite long time uh, in Brazil with liberation theologists. As they said, Jesus worked with the poor he may have been the first communist. So am I. I will not challenge the motivations. I ask, what are your actions? But this is a group that is now in favor of and sponsoring the fastest growing school reform in my nation, and that is homeschooling. And if you have followed the Christian homeschooling websites in this nation, you have seen how rapidly this is growing as well. But three million children in the United States are now being homeschooled. 80% of those children are being homeschooled by women who have given up their paid work and are now teaching at home. And I quote from their work, our task is to create warriors for Christ. I will read, if there is time later on, a particular letter that has been sent to all state-supported, meaning public schools, not private schools, in the United States from this group. This is a group that, again, does not believe in evolution. It wants to rid physics of the Big Bang Theory. Okay. So uh, it's an interesting phenomenon, to say the least. It is the fastest growing educational reform in many ways throughout the world. More children in the United States are being homeschooled than any amount of children who are now in public schools under the new regime of performance testing for teachers. That's how rapidly this is growing. I would urge you to then go to the websites for the Australian Christian Homeschooling Association to look for yourself about what kinds of things 
these are about. Now, I am not opposed at all to parents being deeply involved in their children's education. In fact, parents who are not, or significant others, or extended families who are not, are acting profoundly unethically. But this vision of gated communities where the other, the other of color, the other of cultural differences, the other of sexuality, that we must keep away from our children, who, the others who are seen as forms of pollution. And Mary Douglas would say, purity versus danger. Right? This is what is being constructed. Right? These schools are more racially segregated. Well, in fact, there is no integration whatsoever. OK. There is a fourth group, what I might want to call the new managerialists. And they believe one simple thing. If it moves in classrooms, measure it. And if it hasn't moved yet, measure it anyway in case it moves tomorrow. <laughs> now, I want to be careful about this. As I said, I demand evidence. But what counts as evidence is crucial. If we think, for instance, about the word accountability in English, it has two meanings, not just one. It is not simply certified public accountants saying we want numbers and account. Right? Someone who keeps accounts. It's also if I had, if Julie and I were speaking, and Julie was doing something that was really interesting to me about schools, and I say, Julie, can you give me an account of what went on? That's not numbers. That's narrative. That's autobiographical form. That's the voices of real actors in real communities. Our ordinary language once again points to what is happening about the loss of collective memory of voice. Can we expand the amount of what counts as evidence? And in every nation that wants to have neoliberal agendas where we have accounting, even though the rhetoric is one of voice, the voices are almost never heard. Now, let me go back uh, and say a few things about each of these, and then if there's time, talk about a politics of interruption, some things that are going on right now that are powerful. Let me return to the neoliberal agenda. If we think of this as an umbrella, this is the strongest hand on the umbrella. This is the group with most power, uh, as you know, throughout the world right now, whether it's in Madrid, Lisbon, increasingly in Berlin, certainly in the United States. Mr. Cameron delights in it in England. And unfortunately, in parts of this great nation to, that is becoming constantly a new nation, um, you know, like the United States, it is a vast experiment. And the debate is, what kind of experiment is it? And who will define what that experiment is? In this nation as well, this group is increasingly powerful. So neoliberals believe in economic rationality. It eats every other form of rationality. They're more concerned about property rights than person rights. And that students will be seen as future workers, and they are human capital. Um, the world then is seen in many ways through the eyes of an acquisitive class type. It is a class discourse. But in a minute, I will give some practical examples of why it is fully raced and gendered. It is not only about class. And part of the task is to do what Raymond Williams, I've lost count now. I hope you're keeping count. What Raymond Williams reminds us are words with emotional economies, what he calls key words. And the task in many ways is to take the words we use to think about schools and other places where kids go and teachers work, and to take those words and engage in a process of what might be called disarticulation and rearticulation. To take words that when we hear them, we say, yeah, I like that. To pull them out of their previous history and their previous meanings, to change their meanings, and pull the people out of their old political alliances and educational beliefs to come under the umbrella of a new alliance and a new set of beliefs. These are words that we love. Words like democracy fairness, responsibility, citizenship. All of these words that when we hear them, a wash of warmth comes over us. So they are engaged in a very, very creative pedagogic act 
of stealing the language that most educators like and redefining it. Let me take just one example. If we were to have a conversation, since most of us are in education here, about what would count as a democratic school, it would, what, it would be what we call in philosophy, oh, you'll forgive me, I do have the masters in analytic philosophy, so occasionally I fall back on these tropes, be what we call thick democracy, not thin. It would be fully participatory. We'd ask our teachers participating in it. We'd ask John, for instance, whose voices are heard, what do we know about this, and the we would be pretty broad. We would ask whether kids have a voice, whether the community is being responded to, whether we're talking with them. It's fully participatory. That is, you know, that is our normal, traditional voice about democracy and education. The task of dominant groups is actually to change the very meaning of democracy so it equals consumption practices. So words like democracy have no essential meaning whatsoever. They are what we call sliding signifiers. This glass is democracy. And the task of dominant groups is to pour out Michael Apple and many of us in this audience's preferred meaning of it, keep the glass, this is democracy, and pour in different water, new meanings. And in the process, provide new identities for people about making decisions about what's a good school, where they send their kid, etc. For them, democracy then must be a set of consumption practices. Democracy is not thick. It is no longer a political concept of full participation. It is the thinnest vision we have. Democracy is choice on a market. It is Adam Smith without reading Adam Smith. My favorite quote in economics is not from Karl Marx, actually. It's from Adam Smith. I know that may surprise everybody in this audience. But in Wealth of Nations, I think it's in page 313. I may be wrong. Um, it might be 314. I'll check now. Okay. <laughs> um, in, you know, in, in The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith says, for every one rich person, there must be 500 poor ones. It's a brilliant quotation. It's wrong in its arithmetic. We need a few more poor people. Okay? But it is absolutely brilliant. So the task, in many ways, is to have us think about choice in a market as leading to more democratic forms. Choice equals now democracy. It's a process of declassing, de-racing, and degendering. Do not think of yourself as aboriginal or indigenous. Do not think of yourself as a woman. Do not think of yourself as a working class actor. Do not think of yourself as a teachers union member. Do not think of yourself as, in quotes, a diasporic person who has now come by boat or otherwise to this great nation called Australia. Think of yourself as a possessive individual, and your choices will accumulate as an individual level, so there will be social justice. There is very little evidence that this does lead to social justice. In fact, in almost every nation of the world in which the market has been set loose, and I review all of the research in educating the right way, it has led to greater inequalities, it has led to further racial apartheid, and you need only to go across the sea to a particular nation called New Zealand to see what happened to Maoris once voucher plans came into being. Choice did not lead to increased equality. It led exactly to its opposite. We should be quite worried, to say the least. Now let me give an example of this, because in many ways, this exports the blame back onto schools. It says to people in the Ministry of Education, we are cutting the budget. You will not get the resources that you need. And then we will then blame teachers and administrators, or worse, parents who have made bad choices for their children, when in fact the issue is not choice. It's the defunding of the public sector. Now let me give you an example of how this would work out in daily life. Let's pretend, I know this is a horrible thought, that there are two Michael Apples in front of you. I know that this is a despicable idea. People will run screaming from the room at the thought. There is Michael Apple one, right here. And I am Michael Apple as I am now. 
I'm a well-known professor. I have a car. I have a decent salary. I have a house. OK, and I live in a nice city in which that nice city now has 60% of its children on free and reduced run, lunch, uh, but it assumes that we are all just like we were 50 years ago. OK, that's me now. There's a second Michael Apple here, and that Michael Apple is Michael Apple as I used to be, whose parents were very, very poor, living in tenements in the slums of Patterson, New Jersey the third poorest city in the United States, OK? And the government says to me, or to my parents, oh, Mimi and Harry Apple, my parents, or to Michael Apple now and my children, here is a voucher. Here is a check from the government. We are being democratic. There's a really good school all over there with the high test scores. Here is a check. You can go to the other side of that lovely city that we will call Melbourne, or Auckland, or New York, or Chicago, or Madrid, everywhere, on public transportation that is being defunded. Okay? And you can take your child all the way over there and guarantee their future by putting them in a choice school with the high scores that everyone's proud of. Okay? You need not keep your child in this bad school. In fact, if the market works, that school public will close. And we will fire the teachers, as in No Child Left Behind. We will give that school to a private corporation to run. OK? So it's very democratic. Now Michael Apple's parents over here, number two, have a choice, just like rich people. Right? The same as Michael Apple, number one. Well, my parents, when there was work, worked in factories, were there at 6.30 in the morning. Let us pretend that they go to the boss, the four person, sounds funny, because they're almost all men, the four men at the factory, and they say, boss, I can't be here anymore at 6.30 in the morning to clock in with my card. Because I love my child, Michael, and I want him to go to that damn good school over there with the highest test scores, where we are so proud why should he be stuck in this school with other poor children? Let me take him to Methodist late. No, I won't do that. <laughs> Talk about sensitive subjects in Melbourne. I had to get that in, just so you know that I read The Age, which had 850 articles on it. And everywhere I go over the third bottle of wine, the conversation always is about him. L, C, okay. okay. Have I offended enough of you now? Okay. Um, I'm very good at it. If I haven't done it yet, would you let me know? I mean, it's, it'll cost a little more, but okay, en enough cuteness. So you, can, you know what the boss will say. Yes, you do have a choice. You can be here at 6.30 in the morning, or you can lose your job. Michael Apple number one over here, the government gives me a check. I have a car that starts, and in Wisconsin winters, that is very, very important, as Julie and many other people in the audience know. When it's minus 30, you say, please start or we die. All right? And I say, well, I want to drive my good car to that very good school over there. All right? And I would normally meet my undergraduate future teacher advisees at 8 in the morning before their classes start. And I call up my secretary, and I say, Diane, it's Michael. She doesn't say, Michael who? She says, oh, yes. Right? And I say, Diane, I can't meet my undergraduate advisees any longer at 8 in the morning because I love my child, and I must take that good child over there to that perfect school. No one, my dean, my chancellor, my rector, no one will say anything. Markets privilege those with economic, social, and cultural capital. They always have. They always will. So if we take that as a paradigm case of who is privileged, that is exactly what's happening in Florida, which has voucher plans, Cleveland, and Milwaukee right now. Now, 
Let me turn to neoconservatives for a second to speed up. Okay. Neoconservatives, I've mentioned, have this vision of a strong state. Um, and it is a strong state over culture and knowledge. And its attempt is to restore, it's a cultural project, an ideological cultural project, to restore the lost tradition of official knowledge. I want to give a concrete example of this, to use again as a paradigm case, a lever to pry loose the, the politics in this. We have a new voluntary national curriculum in my own nation in the United States, though I feel almost like an honorary citizen here. Um, at least you are told to vote. Um, we have 50% of the people who don't give a damn. So um, we can talk about that later. Um, but uh, I'm in the midst of worrying about who will be my president. Uh, I prefer it was my president, not, uh, not the person whose name must not be uttered again in this audience. Um, we have a new national history uh, curriculum that says, quite progressively, and again, remember the disarticulation that is going on, that we are all immigrants. Every one of us is equal. We have exactly the same past. The United States, as with many other nations, are all immigrants. From First Nation people, okay, Aboriginal and people in my nation, what we called American Indians or First Nation, um, people who came across the land bridge from Siberia and kept walking and walking and walking. Some of them stopped in Wisconsin. Others went as far down as Chile and the water got cold, so they stopped. Right, from those people to people like my grandparents from Russia, to people from Nigeria, people from Japan, people from China. We are all immigrants. It sounds so nice. But we, we must ask now, whose history, whose commonness is this? Three to five million Africans died in the ships before reaching the United States or Jamaica or Santos in Brazil, three to five million black people died. They threw themselves overboard. They starved. The lovely, disgustingly honest diaries of sharks following slave ships across the Atlantic. Three to five million people died. That does not sound like immigration to me. It was federal policy in the United States of the national government for nearly 100 years to give smallpox infected blankets to Native American people. That does not sound like immigration to me. That sounds darn close to genocide. I'm purposely using almost grotesque examples, powerful examples, to remind us that any attempt to form what is common without the voices of those who are historically excluded from the common is not common at all. And again, I will quote from Pierre Bourdieu, it is indeed an act of symbolic violence. And this nation, like my own, like England, where the empire has indeed come home, we must ask who's common? And any attempt in Victoria, in New South Wales, in Wisconsin, in England, to establish that common without the ongoing deliberative forms is destructive. As Raymond Williams again reminded us, what is common must be our commitment to a participatory process that is never ending. And unless what is common has mechanisms for constant transformation, it can never pretend to be common. The city in which I was born, Patterson, New Jersey, was 40% African American, 40% Latino, and 20% kids who look like me. It is now the second largest Arabic-speaking city in the United States. What is common? What is common is in motion. Culture is a verb. It is not only a noun. It is in motion. And any attempt by ministries of education or governments to establish the common without the ongoing constant deliberation, especially in vast progressive experiments 
like this nation and my own cannot be the common unless it is fully democratized. And that means any curriculum plan must have mechanisms for constant transformation. If it doesn't, it risks being deconstructed and creating more anger than it deserves, even with the hard work of people trying to build curricula all over the world. OK. Um, authoritarian populists, I want to just read one simple thing. This is a letter that has now gone to all schools in the United States from this group. And in many ways, it is now transforming the curriculum of many nations. So I'll just read it. It speaks for itself. <laughs> to the school board president and administrators of X school, I am the parent of such and such a child who attends this school. I hereby request that my child be involved in no school activities and materials listed below. Number, okay, I'll just, I won't read all of it. Values, clarification, use of moral dilemmas, discussion of religion and moral standards, no role playing or any open ended discussions of any kind. <laughs> no discussions of death, no discussions of abortion, euthanasia, suicide, violence, no curricula pertaining to alcohol or drugs. No instruction in nuclear war. Well, I did that all the time. <laughs> Children, let's build a bomb. <laughs> um, no discussions of global curricula. No discussions of parents or parenting. No education in human sexuality, including premarital sex, extramarital sex, contraception, abortion, homosexuality, group sex, prostitution, <laughs> incest, <laughs> masturbation, bestiality. People know what that is. <laughs> Um, um, no discussions of the roles of males and females. No use of pornography. Well, that was very important in my classroom constantly. No use of hypnotic techniques. <laughs> no discussion of organic evolution, including the idea that man, women weren't around at that time, has developed from previous or lower types of living things. No discussions of witchcraft, the occult, the supernatural, or other forms of Eastern religion. Notice what is being, notice the coupling that's going on here. Islam, which is the fastest growing religion in my nation, is now occult and witchcraft. A couple of others, no critical appraisals of any individuals or institutions, no critical appraisals of lawyers, ministers, or physicians, uh, no discussions of income or inequality, um, no autobiographical assignments, no personal journals, no criticisms of existing laws. <laughs> Three million children are being homeschooled, all right? Unless we pay attention to authoritarian populists right now in Israel, in Palestine, in Pakistan, right now, in the United States, here, we will miss the fastest growing movements in the world. I would urge you to pay close attention to that. We must be deeply respectful of religious form. But at the same time, when it is pulled in these kinds of directions very creatively, then we miss what is going on in educational policy. This is the fastest growing textbook market in the world, in case you wondered. There are vast amounts of profit. And as more and more people get involved in this and pull their children out of the schools we care about, they are also pulling the children out of private schools and religious schools. And oddly enough, my brother, who is a born-again Christian of a particular conservative church and a homeschooler himself, as he has said, there is no religious school conservative enough for this. And when his children, my nieces and nephews, say, Uncle Michael, we love you. We're so sorry you're going to hell. <laughs> I thank them for recognizing who I really am. <laughs> OK. Finally, the new middle class, a couple of statements, and then we'll close. This is what we might want to call, and for those of you who are wondering if I, you know, about the academic of this, I reject two class models. So if you've read any of my more academic work, know that I think that we should not assume that there are two classes who are in charge. There is no guarantee that those class fractions within the state 
we can call capitalists, right? They are relatively autonomous actors, and the managerial and professional new middle class is extraordinarily powerful. They do believe in measurement and accountability of a particular kind, and that is a group in many ways that is steering educational policy. It is perfectly possible we will win the fight against PISA as the only metric and still lose in schools. This is a group that believes, again, that it must carve out a sphere of autonomy and respect in the state for its own positions. And those positions are based on its own forms of expertise. Those forms of expertise are absolutely crucial. I need to know empirical stuff. And I think many progressives have de-skilled themselves by saying we only do narrative research, we only do particular kinds of qualitative forms, and in the meantime, experts for hire make decisions about how we interpret material. I want within every ministry of education and every faculty people who have enough expertise to say, but that formula is wrong. You didn't do that correctly. And don't tell me you're still using Lisserl because it's a bit outdated now. Okay, I want that expertise, so do not misinterpret me. Okay? But this is a group in many ways that is providing the technical expertise for neoliberals to do their work. Neoliberalism cannot survive without neoconservatism. It must have a standard curriculum and a standard test to mark what is a good school and what is a bad school. That means you must have mandatory testing and standardization. Markets do not lead to diversity. They lead to a regression towards the mean. Because if I'm teaching X and you're teaching Y, the results are not comparable. You must have the same thing. And therefore, in order for neoliberalism to, to perform in schools, it in fact must have professional and managerial expertise. And we are caught in a situation that is not very good. Because unfortunately, this expertise is being misused. Many of the tests were not built for comparative purposes ever. When I speak to my colleagues in tests and measurement, or in ministries of education who have this expertise, they go crazy. Why are you doing this? Give us time to do this well. And as I mentioned, much of the material on performance pay is using incomparable tests. They're not built for these things. And so does PISA. I've been in Shanghai looking at those schools. There's a lot of kids not taking those tests, believe me. So do not trust the PISA results for a whole array of reasons. And not only because the tail of the test is wagging the dog of the teacher. OK. So given this, what can we do about it? Two minutes, and then I'm done. Three suggestions. We must change, for those of us at universities, what we do. We must be the critical secretaries of successful practices. In almost every school represented in this room and in this city and this state, there are teachers who say, you can't do this to me. They may be shutting their doors, but there's really creative stuff going on out there. I'm not a romantic about that. But part of our task is to change what counts as high impact research as well. Not to throw out what we're doing now. I'm sorry, there's another burden for all of us. We must act collectively with those people who are showing it is possible even in times of horrible disarray and fiscal crisis and attempts to literally close the public sphere. We need to document the successes because the age and especially the Australian and the Herald Sun, which is hard for me to think of as a newspaper, um, <laughs> um, though I want to know what Murdoch thinks all the time. Um, well, that may be... You know, sort of an oxymoron, Murdoch and thinking. But anyway, but, um, but you know, they delight in telling us that there's nothing good going on. That's wrong. There are successes, and they must be documented. We must, at the same time, learn from the South, but a different South than this South. Throughout the world, in places like Brazil and Porto Alegre, there are curriculum forms and teaching that is going on that is truly remarkable with the poorest of the poor. Why should we assume that those people with even less resources than we have are stupid and haven't solved these things? 
Rather than being teachers, sometimes we must be learners. We must learn from indigenous people. We must have their voices and listen carefully and be taught. And we must learn from other nations. Finally, finally, we must remember that nothing we are doing to try and rebuild schools so that they are responsive to what is best in us, to build an education that we will be proud of, an education that deserves the name education, not training. Nothing we are doing now is harder than what we have faced before. My own nation was South Africa. It was apartheid, but it happened to be in the United States. My first teaching was going down and trying to reopen literacy programs for black kids in schools that were closed because they were sold to white citizens councils for one dollar, those public schools, so white kids could not be forced to go to school with black kids. In this nation, the great nation of Australia, I need not tell you what you have been through in the struggle to define who the we is for full citizenship for the first populations of this nation. Nothing we are facing is harder than that. That collective memory shouldn't make us feel depressed. It should have the opposite effect. Cynicism helps the people under this alliance. Our task is not to be cynical, but to tell ourselves there is work to be done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and it's a small gift to help you for the evening. Um, it was a fabulously... <laughs> it was a characteristically passionate and sobering, but ultimately enabling presentation. So thank you very much. And I think there's lots of take-home insights for us all. And I'm particularly struck with your discussion of the pernicious effects of this loss of collective memory and uh, the challenges we face in holding on and working with those memories and making sure we don't forget what's gone before us. So thank you very much thank and you. thank you everybody for coming.